Empire. Training better. It's been a fever dream of this former pro basketball player. I almost have a difficult in the size of athletes because it is, I think it is very difficult. I don't think most people understand the 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 load, not just from the physical perspective load, but the, the challenge, the physical challenge of uh, playing sports at a professional level. That's Nikola Mirvoljevich, CEO of Stride, who listened to his body and created a better way to hear it. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. Load management, biometrics shaping modern training. On this show, they don't feel like completely new concepts, but in the grand scheme of high-level athletics, they are. Nicola was a basketball player not all that long ago, and today sits atop a company that believes can help future stars learn how to use their body to its fullest potential. Our guest this week is Nikola Mirveljevich, who is the CEO of Strive, which is a data platform that is proving to optimize muscle performance for elite athletes and teams alike. Nikola, thank you so much for taking the time. Bram, thanks for having me. Good morning, everyone. Uh, tell me a little bit about Strive. What, what exactly do you guys do? So proprietary algorithms and sensors that uh, seamlessly integrate into any compression clothing. Uh, Strive optimizes muscle performance for elite athletes and teams. Uh, we have a data platform that provides the most complete, accurate, and actionable data for athletes to always compete at their peak performance. And we, with both IMU and EMG capabilities, which is kind of movement and muscle analysis, uh, we can go beyond measuring only external load and providing also intuitive and insightful muscle data. So what are you, or what have you found out in using this technology about how athletes train and how maybe they should change the way they think about training? It's, it's been very fascinating. As somebody who studied biomedical engineering and human performance ontology, you know, you learn, the, you learn the, the basics of what muscles are supposed to do, but it turns out the real world is much, diff, much more different than education and having uh, for the first time compiled the large data sets of muscle uh, performance during the training and games, we see some fascinating insights that at least I get really excited about. And that's, you know, that uh, as athletes, you know, we have a, we have a particular muscles that are potentially underdeveloped from where there should be. You know, when we talk specifically about the posterior chain or back muscles of the right leg and specifically hamstrings and glutes, We've seen a lot of uh, common patterns between different athletes and even like different sports. So, uh, you know, uh, make Nordic curls your friends is what I tell some huh. people. But yeah, um, there are there are patterns that are showing that uh, as athletes, you know, we rely a lot of quads. We rely a lot on compensation that are resulting in a lot of injuries that we see today. You know, a lot of uh, hamstring injury, knee hyperextension, and ankle imbalance. Uh, a lot of those injuries come from, uh, and even lower back pain, a lot of those injuries come from underdeveloped posterior chain. So are, are you talking about partially that athletes should be moving differently, or are you saying they're not building their, their muscles properly to withstand the load that they're asking of themselves? I'm going to go with latter. Uh, I think developing muscle at muscles properly to sustain the load is something that there's just a hypothesis of uh, one guy and of one. So um, there are a lot of opportunities to kind of change the training. And we've seen some exciting, uh, you know, I've worked with some coaches who were able to pick, pick up on that and alter their training methods and um, decrease number of injuries, essentially, and improve overall health and safety of athletes, which I think is the number one goal. Um, was that hard to get trainers, teams, coaches, athletes to change their ways that they train? I, it's a good question. I don't think it is personally. Uh, I think when, when, once you, when you present the data, um, most, most, if not all coaches, you know, maybe I'm biased because I'm working with coaches who are interested in data and they take that data seriously, but yeah. usually it's not, you know, there's always, everybody wants to win more. Everybody wants to be better. And, um, it, 
that data is helping them make changes. So it's been, uh, I haven't seen a lot of problems. I mean, it's an interesting sell, especially on the professional level where the athletes make a lot of money. And if you can make them more available, healthier and able to perform at their peak or as close to it towards the end of the season, what's that worth, right? (laughs) What's, what's the value on that one? Exactly. Exactly. And, and again, it's a, it's really exciting to see the kind of change in culture, not just with professional athletes, but even college athletes, you know, you can see these guys and girls, you know, finishing the practice, asking, inquiring about their data, seeing what can be better, how they improve. So I think we're in a very exciting trend of uh, more engagement and, bottom line, more, more data ownership from athlete side, which I'm really excited about. Um, your background is you played high level basketball in, in Europe. How did you make this turn into this type of technology? That, that's uh, this, this, uh, the idea of strive has been haunting me for the last 20 years. And I, I as I said, I grew up in Montenegro, which is Southeast. Cuba. We had a um, yeah, Eastern European method of training. You know, you train six days a week, five hours a day, uh, the concept of load management is not, is not something that we discuss or we were aware of. Oh. But um, and specifically, I remember in 2002, we were training in the off season in the mountains and we were running hills because um, we used to go, we used to go in the mountains to train our lungs and kind of improve our overall cardio. And at that point, I remember running up the hill and be like, I, I might die today and um, kind of exaggerated, but uh, I was very much aware of where my body was at. And I always wish like, I wish I can communicate these to coaches. I wish that I can understand how, how difficult this is. And that's kind of what, you know, uh, started the whole process. Uh, having, you know, having moved to US and uh, kind of walked away from basketball and studied biomedical engineering and human performance, I always wanted to merge the, merge these data sets and provide these insights so we can quantify fatigue, so we can quantify the, the uh, compensation, and asymmetries, et cetera. So um, it's been 20 years in the making. And again, I think as an athlete, you know, we always wanted to provide, provide great insights, help athletes train better, train safer, safer, but also provide a product that's, you know, um, a lot of times people don't even know that they're wearing it. So comfort and uh, compliance by athletes was a, uh, was a very big goal. So, so you did, when you're running up those hills, you know, something's wrong with what you're doing. You just don't have the data or a way to communicate it. And probably what deaf ears on the other side, because what the old thought was push yourself to the limit, no excuses, just do it. This will make you better. Right. I mean, you're kind of running into all of that resistance. <laughs> Absolutely. I will expose myself here. Every athlete knows how, how tired they are. Some athletes push through, some athletes don't. I was in a, I was in a bucket of athletes who was like, I'm tired. <laughs> but I mean, absolutely, you know, and, and you have a lot of coaches at the end of the day, you know, especially, you know, growing up, you, I used to joke some of the coaches, you know, you injure your ankle, they put you on a bench press to strengthen your ankle. So not not everybody took the approach of really understanding the human body, understanding the physiology and knowing, you know, what are the weak points? And I think that's essential. You know, if you don't measure, you can't improve. It's as simple as that. So it's been, um, it's exciting again to see the culture change more in a positive direction of engagement, of uh, being more and coaches, you know, going out of their comfort zone to learn and to educate themselves more. So I want to talk, ask you a big topic because clearly like you're going to have a lot of insight on this, which is load management, which became a, a big deal in professional sports here. And it's happened, you know, pretty regularly now in the NBA where stars don't play on certain nights or practice less. And there's been kind of a pushback to, hey, wait a minute, you know, like we're paying customers. We understand if you're injured, but we'd like to see you come in. Um how would you talk to teams, players, leagues about paying customers, entertainment value, and protecting the body and getting peak performance when the games matter most? How do you kind of think through all of that? That's a really tough. I, I think the way, and I, you're 100% right, and we've seen that a lot with uh, particular players over the last couple of years that uh, sitting out. And I, I mean, I think it's difficult, honestly. I'm not here. Um, I'm prefacing this with, um, I struggle with the same concept and I've been thinking about it. I think at the end of the day, it comes down to the, the, the concept of, um, 
health and safety is, is extremely important to me. So I'm going to answer this question from that from that angle. I think at the end of the day, it comes down to uh, managing managing before uh, between the games uh, a lot. And listen, I'm a I'm a massive NBA fan. Uh, been for the last 20 years, and uh, um, you know. Uh, I, I buy a ticket to go to the game in five months, and I'm always like, I hope this player that I would like to see is healthy that game. And, That's right. You know, as an athlete, um, I almost I almost always default on the side of athletes because it is. I think it is very difficult. I don't think most people understand the 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 load, not just from the physiological perspective load, but the the challenge, physical challenge of uh, playing sports at a professional level. So I think there has to be kind of a mutual discussion between the league and the players in kind of in structuring, um, structuring the games. I mean, I think we saw a lot of that with the NFL recently with the preseason games. Um, structuring games and the season, and you know what? I understand that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to particularly talk about NBA. I understand, like, you need 82 games and, and then playoffs, et cetera. But if we see athletes, you know, needing a break, I think we have to account for that. And, uh, but again, that brings a complex, um, complex response of, you know, the revenues from the side of the team. And I know they're listening to that, but, um, I think being proactive, managing their training leading into the season, I think preparing athletes to handle these loads kind of as the preseason, throughout the preseason, even throughout the season is extremely important. And honestly, that's one of the reasons why we, I started Strive is to make sure that we can quantify these loads. We can quantify these risks. And we can really understand, you know, maybe an athlete doesn't need to practice every day or lift every day, or maybe they need extra two days of rest instead of one day, but then we know they'll be ready for a game day. So I think it comes down to kind of the, the general education. And I, as, a, as an engineer, you know, data always helps. Yeah. So if we can have the right data, it's, Kind of easier to make those decisions. Yeah, I, I know it's a, it, I know it's a difficult question because more and more and more, it feels like the solution we're getting to is the guys play too much, but that's not an answer <laughs> to the entertainment and financial bottom line of the whole 100%. thing. Hundred percent. But I, I mean, if you look back, you know, I, I grew up in nineties watching, you know, watching Bolts and, you know. Michael and James used that game and they would say today he was very tough. Yes, he was extremely tough, you know, and you have these athletes who, um, who were kind of pushing through. And I think from the scientific perspective, there are anomalies. There are athletes who are just capable of handling things. But at the end of the day, it comes down with the trade off. Um, I, I, I would go to say that I'm sure every NBA athlete can push through the season and really like play every game and, and be fine but what's the long-term cost and i yeah. think that long-term cost is what we all have to be honest with each other yes you know you might want to make more more revenue but is that going to cost the player for being to be out for you know two weeks instead of one day yeah those are <laughs> difficult trade-offs okay so let's get back to the technology here for a moment um what it, what do you put inside of the compression clothing that monitors the data that you collect yeah, so we essentially take compression clothing that athletes currently wear. So whether it's, you know, Nike, Adidas, Under Armour, Puma, whatever it is. And we essentially put large stickers. And those stickers represent sensors and connections. So we, while we do have our own clothing, we essentially literally upgrade the existing brand. So if you have a Nike shorts to everybody looking at the athlete, you know, they're wearing a Nike compression shorts, but that Nike compression chart now can correct, collect 1,000 data points uh, per second. And we can provide this insight because while it was a massive challenge from the beginning, it was extremely important to me that athletes don't feel like they're being monitored, that the athletes are not being, are not being distracted by the fact that they're wearing a, a, a device. So we made sensors that are literally like a sticker on your shirt. They're thin, you can't feel them, and we have a little processing device that uh, connects in a belt, uh, belt buckle area kind of in front. And that device collects all the data, processes it, and then delivers it to the uh, uh, user's app. Um, are, are you guys considering getting into the clothing business yourself and, and 
building out your own compression clothing? Uh, uh, we already introduced it. Yes, we, we have it. And that, um, you know, um, when I started Stripe, I always, you know, um, I always looked at like, oh, it's a data company focusing on, you know, muscles and movement. And I was very scientific about my, about my, uh, uh, about my approach. But at the end of the day, we got pulled in textiles, whether they like it or not. So yes, we have our own clothing. Um, that's also an option, obviously, but you know, a lot of people like to, uh, a lot of people like to update their existing clothing. So, uh, we offer both. Um, all right, give me, um, I'll let you go on this. Just, just give me an idea of what the next three to five years looks like. In this field, how do you see all of this data and all of these changing habits and training methodologies? How do you see that kind of progressing here over the next few years? I love that question. And I love that question because I think we're entering the stage of customization. Uh, serious. You know, customizing training, customizing preparation, customizing recovery. Uh, you know, we have a lot of data sets now. Uh, not just us, but, you know, almost every company can now point you to the, to the what standards and you know in my in my eyes in my world um, i see an ecosystem i see an ecosystem of solutions that can customize the way you train the way the way you prepare for training the way you train and you know imagine if we can start understanding like okay when you sleep like this this is how much how many points of you know energy you have the next day and this is what kind of recovery process you need to take after you do that training. And this is when you should go to sleep. So I think it's this whole cycle of customizing, you know, by tracking your sleep, customizing recovery by understanding your muscles, uh, customizing the, the preparation and nutrition by uh, understanding your, your stress on your muscles. And I think we kind of, when we see all these data sets together, I think there's this beautiful big picture forming that um, I hope, I hope other uh, companies are realizing. You know, there's there's no there's no silver bullet here. There's no single solution that will take us to the promised land. I think we're talking about the ecosystem of data points that can uh, unlock the human performance picture that we've never seen before. You know, over the last 50 years, we've talked a lot. In, in you know physiology anatomy and human exercise classes about this is what the body is supposed to do um, it's fascinating what it's like monitoring the running back when he's pushing through you know four athletes or defenders trying to tackle him down so the, the more we can understand this data set the more we can start thinking like okay what is the body actually doing and how do we how do we fix it? How do we recover it? How do we see that? How do we take care of it to be ready to perform again? It's all really interesting. Nikola Mirvaljevic is the CEO of Strive. Thank you so much for taking the time. Bram, thanks for having me. On the next Future Sport Podcast, one day Tom Brady will retire from the NFL. But currently, his business portfolio has already started growing with the NFT hub Autograph. The new era of digital collecting is coming. The way that I see it, people have a ton of versatility and opportunity to be engaged differently and engage with their favorite leagues and athletes and icons. That's Autograph's CEO, Dylan Rosenblatt. That will do it for this episode. As always, the future is now. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein.